Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the International Spy Museum. My name is Vince Houghton. I'm the museum's historian. And today, we welcome Peter Finn, who is a national security correspondent for the Washington Post. Uh, he spent over 10 years reporting for the Washington Post as a bureau chief in several major capitals, including Warsaw, Berlin, and then finally Moscow. Uh, he's also reported on several significant uh, historical events, most uh, notably the bombing of Kosovo in 1999, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and then the invasion of Georgia by Russia in 2008. He is here because he is the author of a new book, The Zhivago Affair, The Kremlin, the CIA, and the Battle Over a Forbidden Book. Dr. Zhivago, the book itself, uh, is one of the most celebrated books of the last 100 years. Uh, one, Boris Pasternak, its author, the 1958 Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, and it is undoubtedly one of the top books of the Cold War period, and arguably one of the top books of the 20th century, and most certainly one of the top books that everyone's claimed they've read and really only seen the movie. Uh, and and this, is, this is quite unfortunate, because as good as the movie was, and, and it was a sweeping epic love story from David Lean, uh, who had just come off back-to-back -back best Oscars for directing and picture for Bridge on the River Kwai and Lawrence of Arabia. The movie focuses almost exclusively on the love story. It's a beautiful love story, but by focusing on the love story, it does this at the expense of the political, social, and cultural critiques of Bolshevism that are so important to this book. Critiques of the Russian Revolution and the First World War. In David Lean's defense, uh, to do a correct movie based on the whole Dr. Zhivago book would be incredibly difficult and would certainly test the patience of most American audiences. Uh, the Russians in 2006, I believe, did a TV movie version where they tried to be all-inclusive for Zhivago, and it was an eight-and-a-half-hour movie. Uh, not, not likely you could pull that off in, in the United States. So Lean gets a pass, but the real issue is the political element to Zhivago that makes it so interesting, and it's the political element to Dr. Zhivago that has allowed it to endure and become important over all these years. And it's the political element of Dr. Zhivago that caused it to be banned inside the Soviet Union. But no matter how hard the Soviet government tried, they couldn't prevent Zhivago from finding its way behind the Iron Curtain. And that's what Peter Finn will talk about today. So join me in the International Spy Museum in welcoming Peter Finn. Uh, I'm very happy to be at the Spy Museum. Um, thanks for that kind introduction. And and thanks for coming out on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, in early 1958, copies of a Russian language edition of Dr. Zhivago appeared on the grounds of the Brussels World's Fair, the first World's Fair after World War II. It was a very fine edition of Dr. Zhivago, substantial, bound in blue linen. It was also very odd because there was no known publisher of Dr. Zhivago in Russian. The novel was banned in the Soviet Union, and its first Western publisher, um, Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli of Milan, had not contracted for any original language edition. The novel was being handed out to Soviet visitors to the Vatican Pavilion at the fair, and those handsome covers were soon littering the fairgrounds as some of those who got the book ripped off the heavy cover to make it easier to stuff in their pockets. The visitors who got copies from Russian-speaking priests and lay volunteers understood it was an illicit book best hidden from the KGB minders at the fair in Brussels. The CIA, working with Dutch intelligence, was behind this publication, which was printed by Mouton and Company, a distinguished publishing house in The Hague. The agency saw Brussels as an ideal place to distribute the book because an unusually large number of Soviet visitors, some 16,000, had obtained visas to visit the World's Fair, which took place over six months between April and October 1958 at a 500-acre site just northwest of central Brussels. Forty-two nations, including the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and for the first time the Vatican, participated. The fair was a Cold War battleground with both the US and the Soviet Union showcasing their achievements and way of life. The CIA assumed that the Dutch publishing house Mouton 
which specialized in Slavic language books, was about to get the rights to the Russian language version of Dr. Zhivago from Feltrinelli, and that this edition would be passed off as an early run. And there was good reason for this belief. Mouton also thought it would get the rights from Milan. For the Mouton executive who agreed to print Zhivago, this was simply a very profitable early sale, even though he knew that the whole thing was fishy and almost certainly involved intelligence operatives. The deal with Feltrinelli was not finalized, however, and the CIA edition unexpectedly became a pirate one. About 1,100 copies were printed. That screw up sparked immediate speculation about who was behind the printing, and the rumors continued for decades. Der Spiegel, the German magazine, noticed, noted almost immediately in 1958 that one of the volunteers at the Vatican Pavilion was, quote, associated with a militant American cultural and propaganda organization which goes under the name of Committee for a Free Europe. A New York Times book columnist wondered aloud who was behind this Russian edition of Dr. Zhivago and said coyly the answer was, quote, classified. On November 15, 1958, the CIA was first linked by name to the printing in the National Review Bulletin, a newsletter supplement for contributors to the National Review, the magazine founded by William F. Buckley, Jr. In Moscow, the National Review reported, quote, these books were passed hand to hand as avidly as a copy of Fanny Hill in a college dormitory. The speculation continued for years some of it quite fanciful, that British intelligence forced down a plane in Malta that was carrying the Italian publisher Feltrinelli from Moscow, and MI6 officers secretly photographed the manuscript of Dr. Zhivago, which was in his luggage. The only problem with this was that uh, Feltrinelli had only ever been to Moscow once, and that was before the novel was finished by Pasternak. And when he did pick it up in September 1956, it was in West Berlin. It was also speculated that the CIA published the novel in Russian to satisfy a rule of the Swedish Academy, that a work must be published in its original language to qualify for the Nobel Prize in Literature. But the Academy has said there is no such rule, and there is no copy of the CIA edition in its library or archives. Indeed, an internal CIA accounting of where books were sent after they were printed in the Netherlands show that none went to Stockholm. Still others argued that the CIA's role was minimal and that this was all the work of emigre organizations that the agency financed. Bottom line, there was lots of speculation but few facts. I came to the story in Moscow in 2007 when I wrote a story for the Washington Post about a Russian writer's claim that the CIA published Dr. Zhivago in Russian to win the Nobel Prize for Pasternak. As I noted just now, that was incorrect. But I began to read about Pasternak and Dr. Zhivago, the decade that Pasternak spent writing it, his deeply ambivalent relationship with the Soviet state, and the strange bond between him and Stalin, the early hostile reaction to the novel from the state publisher and literary journals such as Novi Mir. In September 1956, five senior editors at Novi Mir wrote Pasternak a 10,000 word rejection letter. It was a detailed summary and condemnation of the book. The letter said, the thing that disturbed us about your novel is something that neither the editors nor the author can change by cuts or alterations. We are referring to the spirit of the novel, its general tenor, the author's view on life. The spirit of your novel is one of non-acceptance of the socialist revolution. The general tenor of your novel is that the October Revolution, the Civil War, and the social transformation involved did not give the people anything but suffering and destroyed the Russian intelligentsia, either physically or morally. The letter captures all of the system's horror at what Pasternak wrote and its determination to stop publication in the West. Pasternak, with a touch of irony, told a friend that he was, quote, pained and regretful at having caused my comrades such work. But he remained determined to see the book published 
whatever the personal cost. Pasternak was never imprisoned, but the state exploited his messy private life and struck at him indirectly by sending his mistress to the gulag twice. Pasternak gave the manuscript to a young Italian, Sergio D'Angelo, who worked at Radio Moscow and who also worked as a scout for Feltrinelli. He was, Feltrinelli was interested in publishing new Soviet literature. The Kremlin, in conjunction with the Italian Communist Party, attempted to intimidate both the author and publisher, stop publication in Milan, and get the novel back. The extraordinary correspondence between Feltrinelli and Pasternak is a testament to artistic freedom. Feltrinelli broke with the Italian Communist Party, of which he was a leading member and financier, and was the first publisher of Dr. Zhivago, which appeared in translation in Italy in November 1957. It was a commercial and critical success, success helped in part by the fact that the Soviets had banned it. Indeed, there is a case to be made that if the Soviet Union had simply allowed a small print run and made no fuss, Dr. Zhivago would have drawn a small elite readership in the West and not have become the international bestseller it did. In its first year, it sold nearly a million copies in the United States alone. Publication followed in 1958 in France, Germany, Britain, and the United States, but not in the Soviet Union and not in Russian. The novel was largely acclaimed. The New York Times Book Review wrote that, quote, to those who are familiar with, the, with Soviet novels, of the last 25 years, Pasternak's book comes as a surprise. The delight of this literary discovery is mixed with a sense of wonder that Pasternak, who spent all his life in the Soviet environment, could resist all the external pressures and strictures and could conceive and execute a work of utter independence, of broad feeling, and of an unusual imaginative power amounts almost to a miracle. The great American critic, Edmund Wilson, writing in The New Yorker said, Dr. Zhivago will, I believe, come to stand as one of the great events in man's literary and moral history. Nobody could have written it in a totalitarian state and turned it loose on the world who did not have the courage of genius. In October 1958, Pasternak won the Nobel Prize in Literature. The Kremlin treated the award as an anti-Soviet provocation and forced Pasternak to renounce it. The elderly author, he was now 68, was subject to an extraordinary campaign of vilification and described as a traitor and a Judas in the pages of Pravda and by the Kremlin leadership. Pasternak was driven to the brink of suicide. He died 18 months later and some people have said his treatment contributed to his death. Pasternak's funeral, an extraordinary scene which we describe in the book, was attended by a huge crowd and in effect was one of the first public demonstrations in the Soviet Union. That is essentially the arc of our story from the creation of the novel to Pasternak's death. It is a story that is partly about the CIA but mostly about Pasternak. It was a story that hadn't been told as a single narrative, in English at least, since Robert Conquest, The Pasternak Affair, in the early 1960s. An enormous amount of material had emerged since the end of the Cold War, including Central Committee and other official Soviet files and the memoirs, diaries, and correspondence of participants in these events. My co-author, Petra Cuvet, who is from Leiden in the Netherlands, and I were introduced by a Dutch writer after my post story on the CIA and Chivago appeared. She had previously written about the Dutch printing of Zhivago and a retired Dutch intelligence officer who was involved in the operation spoke to her about the role of the CIA. That was in 1999 and was the first semi-official acknowledgement of the agency's involvement. Petra is also a Slavist by training, speaks Russian, and lives in St. Petersburg all of which helped her absorb the Russian material about Pasternak and the novel and to be able to work in the Russian archives. We agreed that the 
backstory of the novel was worth telling on its own, but we also thought any book should try and bring something fresh and original to the table. And the obvious outstanding question was the role of the CIA. I first approached the agency in 2009 when I returned to Washington from Moscow where I was a correspondent for the Washington Post. I pulled together what had been written about the agency's involvement and the names of those who were suspected of working on the printing and prepared a memo about the potential book that I wanted to write. The first response I got from the Office of Public Affairs, not an unusual response, was no. Um, were not interested in cooperating. I understood that exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act meant that I would likely get nothing if I went that route. Instead, I spoke to a number of former CIA officers, and there are many of them in this area, maybe there's some here, um, and through their good offices, the subject was brought to the attention of the Historical Records Division at CIA. Um, they shepherded the release of the documents, and from the moment I first wrote to CIA to when I received the documents in the regular mail at my home in Virginia, it took three years. We got the documents in redacted form, and we were able to tease out most of the critical names we needed for the story from other public records, and all of this is documented in our footnotes. The documents themselves are over 50 years old, and while some secrets are held for e forever, not many need not be. It goes without saying that the CIA's history and the story of its officers and operations are part of our broader history and deserve to be told. And that includes the book program that saw the CIA underwrite the translation and publication of millions of books and journals, literature, including Joyce, Hemingway, and Nabokov, but also books on art history, economics, psychology, social, sociology. It was described by one of its participants as a martial plan of the mind. I think it deserves a full history and I would love to see more material on it declassified. It was a thrilling moment to receive the documents. What was most striking about the material was the enthusiasm of the officers writing about Dr. Shivago in internal memos. Here's John Morey, the Soviet Russia division chief, writing in July 1958 when the printing operation was already underway. Quote, Pasternak's humanistic message that every person is entitled to a private life and deserves respect as a human being irrespective of the extent of his political loyalty or contribution to the state, poses a fundamental challenge to the Soviet ethic of sacrifice of the individual to the communist system. There is no call to revolt against the regime in the novel, but the heresy which Dr. Shivago preaches, political passivity, is fundamental. Pasternak suggests that the small, unimportant people who remain passive to the regime's demands for active participation and emotional involvement in official campaigns are superior to the political activists favored by the system. Further, he dares hint that society might function better without these fanatics. There are several other memos like this which suggest a close reading of the novel at CIA. We quote them in the book and they can now be read in full at CIA.gov. There was also an emphasis on secrecy to protect Pasternak. Two rolls of the photograph manuscript were first provided by British intelligence, which insisted that there be no overt American involvement in a printing in case it could be used by the Soviet authorities to hurt Pasternak. That warning was followed by another from one of the British translators, or in fact the man who supervised the translation in Britain of Dr. Shivago, George Katkoff, who told the consul in Munich, the American consul in Munich, that Pasternak had recently noted in a private conversation with one of his French translators that he did not want the book to be published in the United States by US funded groups or by emigres associated with the United States. 
Katkoff said this had no anti-American implications. It was just a matter of personal safety for Pasternak. I won't go into the details leading up to Dr. Zhivago's publication in Russian in The Hague by the CIA, because I hope some of you will actually read the book. Um, let me just say that the first publisher the agency contracted with was a charming ex-Trotskyist cold warrior who was utterly unreliable when it came to keeping secrets and to the consternation of some at CIA, the operation threatened to become some kind of theater of the absurd and that led the agency to turn to the Dutch intelligence service, the BVD. The CIA decided after the award of the Nobel Prize to do a second edition of Dr. Zhivago. There were some lessons to be learned from the first. The Mouton book was too bulky and involving outsiders was nothing but trouble. The second edition was a miniature paperback on Bible stock paper that came in one and two volumes so it could be easily smuggled, quote, inside a man's suit or trouser pocket, as one CIA memo put it. Inside the government, there was also a strong sense that the US should not overplay its hand during the Nobel crisis and the grotesque treatment of Pasternak which was playing out in newspapers across the world, uh, including in countries friendly to the Soviet Union. Instead, officials in Washington relished what they saw as a propaganda coup that was entirely manufactured in Moscow. At a meeting of State Department senior staff with John Foster Dulles, he was told, quote, the communist treatment of Pasternak was one of their worst blunders. It is on par in terms of embarrassment and damage to them with the brutality in Hungary. By July 1959, eight months after the Nobel Crisis, about 9,000 miniature copies of Dr. Zhivago in Russian had been printed in Washington, and the printing was attributed to a fictitious publishing house in Paris. A Russian emigre group in Germany conveniently suggested that it was behind the printing. And that secret basically held for many decades. And it was widely believed that this miniature edition was the work of Russian emigres. The books were passed out by, quote, agents who had contact with Soviet officials and tourists in the West. 2,000 copies were set aside for dissemination to Soviet and other communist students at the World Festival at youth, of Youth and Students for Peace and Friendship, which was held in Vienna in late July and early August of 1959. It was the first such youth festival held outside the Soviet bloc and attracted thousands of students, including from the developing world. All of the festivities and costs were underwritten by the Soviet Union. The, per the festival was personally supervised by the head of the KGB, who previously had been president of the International Union of Students. The CIA underwrote the cost of sending young Americans to the festival, basically to disrupt it, by having them mix and debate with their Soviet and communist counterparts. My colleague at the Post, Walter Pincus, who was there, described it as, quote, a college weekend with Russians. Um, among the activities in Vienna was the distribution of books in many languages, 30,000 books in 14 languages, including 1984, Animal Farm, and The God That Failed. Apart from the Russian edition of Dr. Zhivago, it was also available in Polish, German, Czech, Hungarian, and Chinese at the festival. The novel had been published in Taiwan, and the Free Europe Committee flew in 50 copies for the 400-strong Chinese delegation, which proved to be utterly impenetrable. Some of the Chinese wouldn't even talk to their Soviet or Eastern European comrades. The Soviet delegation arrived in Budapest in a convoy of buses. It was a blistering hot day, and the windows were open. When they reached Vienna and were moving slowly through the streets, the buses were swarmed by emigres, who tossed the miniature copies of Dr. Zhivago through the windows. 
The KGB was obviously aware of these and other efforts to distribute the novel in Vienna, yet they proved not as harsh with the students who picked up the books as one might suspect. One student writing many years later in Russia said the agents told him, take it, read it, but by no means bring it home. Thank you very much. So we are going to open up for questions, uh, but as a moderator, I am going to take the, uh, the right to have the first question, questions. One's, one's quick and easy, the other one a little more uh, detailed. So the first question is, are there still copies lying around of the CIA-created Dr. Zhivago in Russian? Yes, and in fact, my co-author has one, which was given to her by one of the Dutch intelligence officers. Uh, the widow of uh, one of the officers also has one at home that she showed us. Um, when I mentioned that the book was distributed at the Vatican, it was distributed by a Brussels-based group um, called Life with God. Um, they are now associated with, um, I guess it's a seminary near Milan. Uh, it's a Russian, small Russian institution. And we went there to visit them um, because they had files and clips on this group. And there on the shelves, unknown to them, were two Russian language copies of Dr. Shivago, and they were the CIA copies, which we told them, you should be careful, they're valuable now. Yeah, now they're even more valuable now that everyone knows the story. My second question, do you have a sense of, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, um, how the, the the, the attitude towards this book has changed as the Soviet system changed. I mean, I talked about the fact that the Russians themselves made Zhivago into a eight and a half hour TV movie in the 2000s. Do you see or do you have a sense from all your research about how different governments, maybe under the Gorbachev era, viewed this book or would it become more available later well, on? Well, it's, it's readily available in Russia and it's been readily available since uh, 88 when excerpts first started appearing in Novi Mir, the journal that rejected it. My co-author, Petra, is very good on this question. Um, she teaches at St. Petersburg State University, and over the as we've been working on this over the last several years, she has asked her students about Dr. Shivago, and only some of them have read it. It's not, it's on, it's not, um, mandated on the curriculum in Russian schools. So even though uh, Russian kids are reading War and Peace and, um, and other books, only some of them are reading Dr. Zhivago. But the, I think the older generation, those who read the book um, in the Soviet Union um, and read it as a forbidden item and with such pleasure, I mean, they continue to have a huge attachment to it. But you walk into any a bookstore in Moscow or St. Petersburg, and you can buy it. It's, yeah, it's easily available. Questions from any of you? And uh, please wait for the microphone because it's being taped. Uh, we'll bring you one if you have any questions. No. The CIA was always riven with disputes over whether things or people from Russia were moles or uh, of suspicious character. You know, guys like Angleton who were suspicious of everybody. Uh, any conflicts or disputes within the CIA about this, particularly after he won the Nobel Prize? Uh, I don't think so, because this occurred in um, 58 and um, 59. So the worst of the mole hunting, uh, the worst of the counterintelligence operations that in fact purged many um, people who, from the CIA under a cloud of suspicion who were ethnic Russian or of Russian descent, that had yet to happen. So at this moment in time, the Soviet Russian, Russia division of the CIA had a lot of ethnic Russians, people of first and second generation Russians whose parents and grandparents had fled the Bolsheviks, who spoke fluent Russian, read Russian fluently, and when the, this manuscript arrived, were able to read it and read it with great pleasure and be astonished by it. Uh, you mentioned that it, had, it was made for American audiences, but even so, it does have a very acidic view of the um, authoritarian nature of the system, its uh, the unpreparedness for World War I, the, 
the the gratuitous murder of the czar. So you're talking about the movie? Yes. Yeah, he said that. Said but that. okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the book, uh, the movie, like any uh, adaptation of a novel, particularly a novel as sprawling as Dr. Zhivago, is going to be uh, an abbreviated experience. Um, Pasternak was not happy at the politicization of um, his work, at the way people read particular passages and only singled out those passages for comment. Um, he saw his book as a, an entire experience teeming with life and that it wasn't all political and he regarded himself um, as apolitical. In fact, he, he never openly, you know, he became disillusioned with the Soviet state as the worst of the terror happened. Um, but as late as 36, he was writing a poetic ode to Stalin. But after that, the disillusionment became more and more pronounced. At the same time, he was never confrontational. He never stood up and figuratively shook his fist at Soviet power. He lived in the isolation of his own creativity. Um, he did his own thing, and that's why the novel was so startling uh, when it emerged, both for the Soviet censors who read it and couldn't believe it, and, and for the Western readers who had never seen a book quite like this come out of the Soviet Union. So whatever you think of the novel, and there are mixed uh, opinions on it, it was uh, an original, a deeply original work. You mentioned some other authors earlier. Um, do you think the CIA had it helped their, them in their careers, like Nabokov, and I think you said Joyce? No, I mean, they were simply, uh, Nabokov was a huge success in the West. Um, as were, you know, they didn't, CIA didn't need to do anything for James Joyce or Ernest Hemingway or any number of T.S. Eliot. I could go on and on. What they did was they translated that work into Russian, and not only Russian, but into the languages of Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And then they attempted to send these books east through a variety of means. In Eastern Europe, they used a mailing system where they simply mailed the books to people in Poland, Czechoslovakia as it was then, um, and other Hungary, other places. That was much more difficult to do in the Soviet Union. If Soviet visitors were in the West, they would hand the books out to them at whatever location they might be. If Western um, tourists and others were going to the Soviet Union, they would give them two or three books, four books. Say, when you get to Moscow, when you get to St. Petersburg, you meet someone, give them a book. The American embassy in Moscow also had stacks and stacks of books. When diplomats went out, um, even though their travel was limited, they would try and pass books out. Uh, if you went to Stockman's, which is a famous, uh, it's now a big grocery store in Moscow, but back then it was a grocery store in Helsinki. And if you uh, spoke to a CIA guy who said, if you went to Stockman's in Helsinki, where all the Westerners stocked up on all the stuff they couldn't get in Moscow. There was a section with all of these miniature books, Western literature. These were all CIA books. No one, he said when he shopped there, he knew they were CIA books, but no one else did. And the CIA, I'm told by former officers, had its own uh, library of miniature books out in Langley, and um, I'm shocked to tell you that at one point to make space, they just destroyed them all, which is really hard to believe. Was there any danger for people who, say a tourist who gives someone a copy? No, it was regarded as a minimal risk thing. If you have two or three books in your, um, in your suitcase and they ask you where you get them, you just say, oh, I got them from a Russian friend. They, they generally would prep people. Um, for instance, even in London, there was a place, if you knew you were going, you could go and pick up books in Pimlico in London. Um, and they would give you, a, and this, the memos on Chivago show this, they would give a little guidance to you. Don't take too many books, just hand them out. If you get caught, say, well, I got it from a Russian friend. And, and But those were intelligence officers or just tourists? No, they, how the CIA tourists had other out? things to do rather than talk to tourists. So These how, were agents that they would, that, for instance, the, to run this entire program of getting books into the Soviet Union, 
the CIA created a company called the Bedford Publishing Company in New York. It ultimately had offices in London, Rome, and various other places in Europe. It was run by and founded by a guy called Isaac Patch, a veteran of Radio Liberation, what became Radio Liberty. His obituary was just in the Washington Post last week. He died in Vermont at the grand old age of 101. Um, and there was an equivalent organization called the Free Europe Press, also based in New York, and this, they ran these operations. So the CIA itself simply provided the money. I have a question. Who curated what books would go over? That's a, <laughs> I, you know, what, what part of the CIA well, I, I was doing it, that? It, well, there was a, a part of the CIA called the International Operations Division. Um, and the International Operations Division essentially ran all propaganda operations. So that would include Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe. It would include the subsidy of all kinds of activities in Western Europe, including uh, intellectual magazines like Encounter, which C the CIA funded. It included art exhibitions by American painters in Western Europe. It included tours by American orchestras, including the Boston um, Symphony. CIA paid for all of this through various front organizations. They had two, two goals. One was in Western Europe, and that was to build support for the US and the American way of life and American culture. And, and they allied themselves and subsidized the European non-communist left. So they were not giving their money to conservatives in Europe because they regarded that as a waste of time. They wanted to give their money to, the, to Western European intellectuals, to Western European liberals, to Western European socialists, as long as they weren't um, communists. You can imagine trying to go up to Capitol Hill get money to, uh, to give to European socialists. It, wouldn't have, it could only have happened as a black budget. But it is controversial uh, you know, whether you should be secretly subsidizing this kind of activity in a democratic society, which France and Britain and Italy and Germany were. And then you had a parallel track, less controversial, which was to get all kinds of intellectual material, not only literature, but books on art history, psychology, sociology, economics, history, biography, agriculture, get these books into the Soviet Union. Um, and the range of books that Bedford um, secured the rights for, translated and sent over, is enormous. And I would love, it's still classified, but I would love to see the list of everything they paid for. If Pasternak didn't intend his novel to be a political novel, was he surprised by the reaction to it? Did he consider that this was just a work of imagination and art and characters? Um, no, I don't think he was surprised by it. I, I, you know, I think Pasternak is, was a very astute, um, deliberative uh, person who, who thought many times several moves ahead of those um, who were trying to suppress his work. Um, I think he thought that some of the reaction in the West was naive, that it was selective, um, and that it didn't, you know, didn't fully appreciate what he wanted to achieve as an artist. Um, but, you know, that was part of the reaction. There were others, obviously, who um, his allies in the West, critics in the West, who understood and loved his book in the way he would want them to. How did the CIA find the book down in Milan? They didn't. It seems unreal. That, that was, uh, I was saying that was a fanciful notion. That never happened. Uh, the, book, the CIA got the book from British intelligence. Uh, where British intelligence got it is a really good question, but we don't know the answer. There were um, a number of manuscripts circulating in Britain at the time with the publisher, uh, with Isaiah Berlin, with George Katkoff, who was supervising the publication, um, with the translators, um, with the Pasternak family, because his sisters lived in England. Um, but where they got it and whether the person they got it from even knew that they were photographing it, we don't know. We know that the answer lies in um, the archives 
of the British government and probably at CIA, but they redacted that. So it's a, a question to be resolved maybe 50 years from now. You might get that answer. <laughs> I just wanted to know if there are any contemporary parallels to this, and not necessarily CIA, but is this still this kind of thing still going on that you know of? Well, if I knew about it, uh, it wouldn't be very successful, but, um, <laughs> but let me say, I doubt very much that the CIA is um, publishing books, but my guess is that the CIA is all over social media and is all over the digital world and all over the places that matter in ways that are covert and we will learn about in several decades. Um, I can't really think of, I mean, I guess the closest, in terms of a worldwide literary storm over a single book, um, you know, that galvanized world opinion in the way this did for that period of time around the Nobel crisis, I guess the Salman Rushdie satanic verses would be the closest I could come to. I had a question. Um, when Dr. Zhivago was given to these young Russians back in the 50s and 60s, have there been interviews now or um, recently of how this resonated with them at that time and what stood out to them as they read Dr. Zhivago in that particular period? Yeah, I mean, there people have... Um spoken to people who got the book and read it as a piece of forbidden literature. And I think um, across, not just uh, the Soviet Union, but across Central and Eastern Europe, there was a tr voracious appetite for literature they, it, in ways that have completely faded away. I mean, because it was forbidden, and because it was a pre-internet, pre, almost, not quite pre-television, but it was a, a major form of entertainment for many, many people. And so Russians, Eastern Europeans loved great literature and loved to read. Um, and I think they responded um, with great enthusiasm when a friend, someone they trusted, passed them a book. And that was the CIA goal. They, would hope, they didn't give the books to people hoping they would hold on to them. They wanted one book to be passed among 10 people. If that happened for them, that was a success. You have to remember back then, uh, poets could fill you know, a football stadium in Moscow. Um, it was a different world. People went to see people recite, recite poetry. They were falling, you know. Pasternak in 46, 47 did some public, public recitals with others at movie theaters and and the Polytechnic University in Moscow where people literally were bursting the auditorium. They were sitting on the floor, they were spilling out the doors. And that's how much people wanted to listen to this and hear this. Now, interestingly, we are talking about a, str a particular strata of Russian society that were passing these manuscripts one to the other and reading them. And if you read David Remnick's book, Lenin's Tomb, he talks about how after Dr. Shivago came out, he was noticing all these people on the metro in Moscow reading it, um, regular folk. And for him, it, it seemed to him that it was now the turn of the ordinary people in Russia to read it. The intelligentsia had already read it. You know, it wasn't novel for them when pa Shivago came out in 88. But for many, many other people, it was their first opportunity. And that was a question I was going to ask. It, the tool of propaganda is to convince people that weren't otherwise thinking your way. Is there a sense that the people that got their hands on Dr. Zhivago in the 50s and the 60s were already leaning in that direction anyway? They, they were the Soviet intelligentsia who were probably perhaps already a little critical of the Soviet system to begin with. Is there any sense that people were convinced of the, the themes in Javaga who wouldn't otherwise have thought that way beforehand? I think probably not. I mean, uh, I think some people um, read it politically. Some people read it simply as a piece of literature and wondered why, what the fuss was about. Certainly Khrushchev, when he 
finally read the book said he didn't understand. I mean, he had only ever gotten selective quotations from his, the literary bureaucrats in Moscow. And when he finally read the book, um, he didn't under, I mean, he was the guy who banned it, essentially. He was the general secretary. He didn't understand why it had happened. Um, at the time, you know, among Americans who were in Moscow, and there were some at the time of the Nobel crisis, and who spoke to people at Moscow State University and at Leningrad State University, their feeling was that the majority were against Pasternak. Um, there was a minority, obviously, who supported him, but uh, a lot of people felt it was a betrayal to send the book abroad. People that read the book or just the Just students, just, just students, yeah. Was there a similar secret pathway of getting the movie into the Soviet? Uh, the, movie, the movie was banned. The movie was not available. It didn't show. However, uh, the American, emb the U.S. Embassy in Moscow held private screenings, and the uh, the Soviet authorities, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, objected very strongly to what they saw as a provocation. Um, but yeah, there were there were only some private screenings organized by American diplomats. Please join me in thanking uh, Peter Finn from the Washington Post for joining us here today. Uh, we have a, a selection of uh, the book in the back uh, that you will stay and yes. sign for people. So if you want to purchase the book from us, uh, Peter will sign it for you and he'll be in the back later on. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the International Spy Museum uh, and please come back for our next author debriefing. <laughs>